I'm David Henry Huang. Uh, I'm a playwright and uh, chair of the American Theater Wing. And uh, we are incredibly proud of the Broadway season this year, and particularly the fact that the four Tony nominees for best play are four American plays, four American playwrights making their Broadway debuts, and gender parity, two females, two males. So, yay. So it's an incredibly exciting season, and uh, clearly one of the major highlights of this season and of the new plays uh, is the work we're going to be discussing tonight, this extraordinary piece, A Doll's House Part Two. And we're going to be joined tonight by the playwright, the director, the four cast members, all of whom, by the way, are Tony nominated because this play because this show has been nominated for eight Tony Awards. And it's also a rarity in that this is a straight play making its world premiere on Broadway. Um, I'm trying to find out from the theater geeks out there when the last time a new play premiered, world premiered on Broadway, and so far we don't have the answer, but who knows, maybe we'll get it in the next you know, half hour or so. So um, to talk about Dolls, A Doll's House Part Two, let me start by introducing the playwright and director, Lucas Nath and Sam Gold. Thanks so much. So we'll start with Lucas, because you wrote it. Um, so this is, uh, as most of you are very aware, a sequel to uh, Ibsen's iconic play, A Doll's House, uh, following the uh, fate of uh, the lead, Nora, and, and, and the other some of the other characters. So when you decide to write a play, and you're going to call it A Doll's House Part Two, there's really a major gauntlet that you're throwing down. <laughs> Um, and it could be considered incredibly courageous, which I think it was, and I love these, you know, these high-wire acts that succeed uh, when a playwright takes a big risk. But really, what were you thinking? <laughs> and you know, what's the origin story of this play? Um, the origin story is I wrote the title on a piece of paper and I thought it was a funny title. Um, it, it seemed audacious. It, 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 it did seem kind of a, like a ridiculous thing to do. And, and when I went to write it, I was just really writing it for myself. Like I, it was a sort of naughty little exercise I was doing. Um, so I wasn't really thinking about anybody reading the play or, uh, I mean, it, it was in fact a, a commission from a theater, but I wasn't even thinking about the fact that they would produce it. I was just uh, playing around. And is this one of these plays where, like, d d did you know the beginning and ending, and ending? Did you outline it, or did you just kind of follow your gut? No, this, I, and I, I do sometimes outline, and I do sometimes know the beginning and ending, or I know the ending and I'm working towards it. This was a case where I knew that the play had to begin with a knock at the door, because, again, that made me laugh. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, the, the process of writing it involved um, the real springboard, was I went and found the worst translation I could find of a doll's house online. Like I went to some uh, website that had like a blue background and some kind of pattern and I cut and pasted the, the text into a, a, a document and I went through and just rewrote the whole A Doll's House Part One um, in my own words and I stripped out anything that was not necessary. Um, or I stripped out a lot of things that we very quickly associate with A Doll's House, for example, the, the macaroons. So I ripped out all the references to that. And I, um, something that started to happen as I did that is what, what became really apparent was uh, this is a play about two people who cannot have a real conversation. They are so terrified of offending the other or saying the wrong thing or starting a fight that they are just like mired in some kind of passive aggression. 
and that seemed, and, and, and Doll's House does end with half of a fight, but that told me that the mandate for writing a play was uh, uh, Nora and Torvald need to have it out. And so I knew it started with a knock at the door, and I knew that these two were gonna have to really fight. That's amazing. Um, and so this play uh, here on Broadway, the lead producer is the um, iconic Scott Rudin, who also lead produced last season's Tony Award winning The Humans. Um, so given that you were writing a play that you figured no one was gonna really even read or perform or anything, uh, how, does the, how does it happen that you're on Broadway and do you get a call from Scott and what does that feel like? I'm still not sure. I, I still don't know entirely the story of how he got the play because I wasn't giving it to anybody. But I got an email from my agent that was forwarded from Scott Rudin reading Doll's House Part Two, read it, love it, want it. Um, and my agent said, do you know how he got it? It's like, I don't know. So um, that's mysterious, but... Um, <laughs> And I think it's almost like our one year uh, 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 my, my one year anniversary of the first time I met Scott. So it was really fast how this all happened. Um, but yeah, I, I don't entirely know how it happened. So let's move into that uh, fastness. Um, so Sam, um, how did you get involved with the project? And um, let's start there. Uh, when Scott mysteriously read the play, <laughs> And he, I think he read it and had the immediate strong feeling that it belonged on Broadway and belonged on Broadway without um, starting somewhere else. He just wanted to do it. He wanted to not talk about it, he just wanted to do the play. And uh, he sent it to me in, we, were, we just went, I just went through my emails to find this timeline because it's so bananas how quick it all was that I had to get confirmation in my own email. It was mid-August. I was working with Scott on another play, and we were in um, rehearsals for something. And he sent me. Uh, he was like, I, "I I read Lucas's play, and it's really great, and I want to send it to you." And I said, "I'm a big fan of his. We've never gotten to work together. Um, it sounds great. I'd love to read it." Thinking it would be something for five years from now, and he sent it to me. And it's you know, as you can imagine from watching tonight, it. It's like that on the page. It's just it's a, it it's a very it's a very exciting read. You see the title, you think you got to be kidding me. You jump in, and then it just keeps surprising you. And I read it. I said to Scott, "Let's do it." And that was mid-August. Um, we sort of wrestled about schedules for two weeks. Wrestled about trying to get a cast for two weeks. We were announced for Broadway, I think like October 1st. Like I think I read it in mid-August and I had, I had dates, a theater, a design team, and a cast five or six weeks later. It's never, that's never happens. So uh, for those of you who aren't aware, normally uh, what, three to five years or something, you know, if you're lucky, uh, and numerous workshops and uh, an out-of-town production at least, or off-Broadway production. Um, and what did you guys do to, do to develop the show? Well, Lucas was really smart about this, um, uh, knowing that, that you should talk about this, but that there's a real process uh, between the draft that I had read and the draft that Lucas knew he would have in production. And so we, we within the confines of Scott producing it for Broadway, we made a schedule for script development that you'd have if you were doing it anywhere. Um, if he was gonna have his out of town or, you know, uh, if he was gonna have that five year process, how could we do that between now and the opening night date that had been set for April 27th? And the really, really good thing about that story is that for my end, and then I'll let Lucas tell, more important part of it. But from my end, as a director, you're, you, when you're developing a play, you don't know where you're headed. There's a lot of a neurosis that comes from sitting down with a new script and not knowing. And as a director, it makes my job so much better when I can sit in the room early on knowing 
who are we working for? Who, who is the cast? And what is the theater? And who is the audience? And when are we going to see this? And, and, it, and it galvanizes everybody to a very specific goal. You're, you're working towards Lori's voice. You're, you're working towards the golden theater. You're thinking about things in a very concrete way, not in a way of this could be anything. The, the, the sort of blankness of that, this could, we could be doing this in Seattle in a thousand seat theater or in downtown Manhattan in a 70 seat theater and I'm not sure who's gonna be in it, but let's develop the play is a very different thing than when someone says to me, you've read a script, here's an opening night day to the Golden Theater and a cast, now develop the play. So that was a very nice and very different process. And how does it feel for you, Lucas? Are you, are you uh, someone who really needs uh, deadlines? Um, no, no. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm very, um, I'm very rigid. I'm very, I have, a, you know, when Scott called me and asked me what I needed to take this play to Broadway, I said, well, I would like one workshop, if not two. I would like to have a break in the workshop so that we work for a couple of days and I like to go away and work and then come back. Um, there's a dramaturg that I really love working with, Sarah Lunny, and I asked that she be brought on board. So basically, I replicated my process of working uh, at, say, the Humana Festival when I'm premiering a play there. Um, and uh, uh, you know, I, have this, I have this particular process of, of when I workshop a play, I bring in these things I call scraps, which are these little bits and pieces of text that are basically every every beat of the play, but every alternate version of that beat, or every possible beat or action I can imagine in being in the play. And then I just make the actors read through them over and over, and I start to try to figure out, like, what of this is interesting? Does it belong in the play? Does stuff that's in the play not belong? Can I stitch that in? So um, deadlines are great. I, I, when I work, I actually try to go out of my, my way to find chances to get into rooms with actors to sort of do this kind of stitching and, and modular work. Great. Well, that seems like a good segue to bring on our Tony-nominated cast. Please welcome Lori Metcalf, Chris Cooper, Jane Howdyshell, and Condola Rashad. guys. Thanks for joining us. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of extraordinary things about this play, and I love it so much, and I love your performances. And, uh, you know, obviously, one of the uh, unusual aspects of it is that it as, uh, takes, as a jumping off point, uh, Ibsen's play, and yet it stands so completely on its own. So, um, to what extent it are, was in the working of your characters, is it necessary for you to incorporate the backstory from Ibsen's play uh, to form the characters for this play. Was that a consideration or not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, certainly, certainly it matters, it matters. Um, there was um, the particular translation that I had on my, on my shelf I, I dug into and Good Lord, I, I, it must be um, it must be 60, 70 years old translation, but it worked for me. I've seen I've seen um, uh, versions of it on film. Uh, while I live in Massachusetts, uh, just before coming to New York to work on this at Hunting, Huntington Theater in Mass, they uh, were doing a production. I said, nah, you know. It would be good just just to hear, just to hear the words, um, and um, I mean certainly it's it, it makes a difference, and 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 in another way it's not monumental that um, it'd be such. Um, 
I obviously went back and read the play just to remind myself of the circumstances. But the way that Lucas has constructed it with this 15-year gap, it's like a brand new character because Nora has gone off and reinvented herself, had all these life experiences, and um, and is a is a brand new. I, I gave that to to my that gift to myself to make my own starting off jumping off point. Um, yeah, and, and 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 I think that I think it works for. I think I think that this is a Nora that we would never have seen had she not left, obviously, and had these experiences. So it's kind of like a free pass that way to do to to invent her. How, however, like maybe her humor came forth all of a sudden, or maybe you know just. Or, um, so it was more for the to remind myself of the plot and the circumstances in in the first one. Um, since you mentioned humor, I mean, one of the things that's extraordinary about this play is that it's, you know, Doll's House Part Two, and it's so funny. Um, and to what extent were, did, did you, I mean, either did you know that you're writing a comedy, or did you guys realize when you signed on to this uh, uh, th that this play was as funny as it is, or was that something you kind of discovered the first time you were in front of an audience in previews on Broadway? You know, I actually remember reading about, uh, a couple of critics have said this, that the in, in Norway, when Ibsen's plays are performed, it's not uncommon for it to get, for those plays to get big laughs. And uh, a couple of years ago, or many years ago, I saw Lee Brewer's um, production of A Doll's House, which uh, uh, I won't go into detail, detail describing, but was an incredibly funny production of the play. So I actually always thought that Ibsen was pretty funny. It's just that the translations don't really communicate that. So I had hoped it would be funny, but uh, I had certainly at points in various workshops prior to this cast being assembled, uh, heard it not funny and was... <laughs> So it takes a special group. I, I mean, Laurie, you've talked about um, reading it on the page and... In, 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 I saw a lot of humor on the page, uh, starting with the title, which I found hysterical. Um, and uh, so I knew that since there was some obviously obvious built-in humor on the page coming from Lucas, that he probably would be open to finding more. So I looked at that uh, ajar door and tried to poop, shove it open a little further. <laughs> um, anybody else on the humor question? No, no. I, I thought it was funny. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's about all I got. I thought it was, and it is. I mean, it's, it's delightful to hear the play every night through your ears. And um, when we first started performing it, we didn't know, you know, whether people would be as amused as we were. <laughs> but but um, no, I think that the, the comedy in the play is great. And it's organic and off kilter and fun and surprisingly contemporary. And I just love all those elements in the play. I agree. <laughs> and so Lucas is talking about this workshop process. Uh, were many of you involved in the workshops? Um, so, w w yes. Yes. So, uh, so what is? Th how does that work? Like he gives you scraps of things to read. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, no, I mean, we always had the base of it, and then basically he might come in and he would have a few versions of parts of scenes. Uh, we were trying to figure out exactly um, what the specific composition was going to be. So there were certain parts of the play that used to be here, and now let's see if we can try and hear what it's like if it comes here instead of there. And so it was just about kind of hearing it out loud, I think, and, and giving Lucas a chance to hear it come from us and, and see what felt most organic. And can anyone identify any specific things that changed uh, either in the workshop process or the preview process? Your, your last line. Oh, the last line of the play didn't come in until halfway through previews, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, uh, there, were a there were maybe uh, three options we were playing with. I mean, really just two main ones, and then we settled on this last one. 
Um, I mean, so many things changed. <laughs> uh, so like when, what, one that I remember is when Emmy has that very um, powerful speech about marriage in, 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 in uh, um, advocating marriage, her very powerful speech, that I remember you saying that then it became lopsided, that my character needed, needed to come back with something. And you wrote the lines, you know, you don't know what I've tried to give you, um, what I'm, I'm trying to change the world for you. Um, and also the lines over here by the, wall, what am I saying? Um, you know, I do believe in marriage, I do, but marriage is, but love is different. I do believe in love, but love is different from marriage. All those were additions late in the game to balance out Emmy's very strong speech. Um, and I remember Jane, um, we were gonna cut some lines about what Jane's, back, not backstory, but your living condition was mm. and we, then we all felt like you, you, we needed to be reminded that she had a little room in the back and was on some tiny allowance and all the all, you know, that's when people would um, advocate for their character. Uh, but there were many many changes. So in terms of this whole balance question, because you know Nora is obviously. Uh, kind of a, a major, at least 19th century kind of feminist icon. And you guys are revisiting this uh, f from that perspective, but also from a contemporary perspective. Um, so to what extent was, the, were the, was that responsibility kind of, I guess, in your mind, either as you were writing it or as you were advocating for your characters or directing it? I mean, gosh, I'm trying to think of a way that's not a long, rambling answer to this question. Um, yeah, I mean, the first and foremost on my mind was uh, uh, just trying to make sure that we understood what every character in the play was trying to get and what were the stakes behind it. Like, that was the, that was the base level of... I needed to know that for everybody. But um, one of the things that we did in the course of the early October workshop process, the first time that this cast got together, was that we got a bunch of uh, uh, scholars, uh, folks like Elaine Showalter, Carol Gilligan, these uh, uh, Norwegian scholars, some feminist scholars, to come in and read Nora's arguments and note them and to respond to them. Like, every single point she makes, they, we ask them to sort of give their own response to it. And, um, you know, it, it, was, it, it was interesting because one, it gave us a chance to figure out, oh, well that's a really interesting counter argument for one of the other characters to make. Or at times we would subtract something from her argument that we thought um, too much jeopardized the stance that she was taking and distracted us from whatever it was that she was trying to get. I don't know if that really directly answers the question, but that was something we were thinking about a lot. Um, Laurie, do you, do you recall anything that sort of addresses that as well, or, or Sam? I mean, I actually think that question guided a lot of the rewriting process. Yeah. I think that what we all read when we first read it, it was a draft that what ha that all of the character and all of the drive and all of the spark of it was there but that you didn't know when you when we started out how how everybody's arguments were going to balance each other and how Nora was going to win you know you you need those you need those arguments to be balanced but from what you're saying about this is, if you're going to bring back the most famous 19th century feminist uh, from dramatic literature and bring her back to the stage, there's a, there, there, she, has to, she has to leave, she has to come through that door for a reason, but she also has to leave the door at the end for a reason. And I think that the reason she leaves at the end was always, I think, the, the biggest thing hanging over um, the rewriting process because of the weight of what that um, was going to be saying about um, about why to bring back this character, and that was a great, I think, because we had these scholars and we all had all of us in a room, and it was a good. It kind of gave us a little um, 
a little a, a little extra motivation to kind of do do Nora proud in some way that way. We knew she had to have a second epiphany, the, her second epiphany, and we knew it had to happen in the Emmy scene. So there was a lot of playing around with that. And what, what was going to trigger her epiphany to know that, you know, no, the, no, the world isn't going to change unless I go out there and do it myself. Um, that, was, uh, that was high on the list. Mic choreography. Um, so I'm going to br bring up a slightly different issue, which is, you know, just as a a theater artist of, of color myself, I'm always looking for more opportunities for, um, for other artists of color. And it's often, you know, often the argument is made, oh, well, an audience can suspend its disbelief for a lot of things. Like you can have an actor playing four parts, 10 parts, 20 parts, and the audience can suspend its disbelief. But if you have a family and the actors are, you know, of different races, well, the audience can't deal with that. Um, but Clearly here, you made the decision, and you can, and, and the audiences can, and it feels like you've just cast the best actors for the parts. And <laughs> so how was that decision made? And um, uh, let's talk about that a lot. Uh, I mean, I'll say that, that my first dinner with Scott, I said, I, I I think we wanted, uh, we, there's no reason to cast all white actors in this play. There's no good reason. And um, uh, I, I think the, uh, so, so we, wanted, we wanted to sort of open up the casting as much as possible. Um, there's also something, you know, this is a play that is the, there's that concern that like, oh, or people can get really literal minded about like, oh, wait, why is, you know, Emmy doesn't seem to match her parents. And the, um, I mean, if you look at the design, it's deeply abstracted. It's design telling you, don't take this thing so literally. These are the mythic iterations of these characters on stage. And so uh, I actually rather like plays that are somewhat abstracted because it sort of lets us get non-literal about stuff that frankly I don't care about that much. I would, I would rather just have the best actor in the part and, and open up the casting as much as possible. Yeah, we just made offers to a dream cast and then they all said yes. <laughs> and And I find the fact that we even have to talk about that from that from a perspective of diversity a depressing round of applause for me. Um so given that you guys all that you made offers, you guys all said yes. You all knew this was a new play and that it was going to open cold on Broadway. Um is there like a is there a calculation that an actor makes about is this a good idea or is it really just you look at the script you decide whether you're going to do it and it would, wouldn't make any difference really if it was I mean the, the additional pressure on of Broadway d doesn't factor in as much. I mean I just read the play and was like yeah I want to do the play so that was mm -hmm. the first number one that was that was it and then. You know, when you read the play, you can see why there was so much faith, why, there, why, why you know, we, people had so much faith in it in terms of it being, the, you know, going straight to Broadway because it's, it's that's, the play is that rich. And so I believe that as well. And I think when you really believe in something like that, and also if you're really moved as an artist to do something, you kind of just go, I'm going to do it. You know, yeah, sure. I mean, if in another mindset, you certain people might, you know, get more calculated about it. And that's one way to go about it. But I think at the end of the day, as an artist, you kind of just decide what is going to, what it is that you feel, not, uh, when it is, what story you feel you need to tell. And it was something that I felt like I wanted to be a part of telling. So that was the most important thing. Uh, yeah, I was really, really attracted to the play. It was, it's an attractive play on so many levels. I mean, in terms of its ideas, in terms of, the characters themselves, in terms of the 
stylistic quirkiness of it. I, everything about it just seemed really attractive to me. I'd never worked with Sam Gold, and I always wanted to, so that was attractive to me. And um, when I heard who everyone else in the cast was going to be, that was really attractive to me. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it was, seemed like kind of a no-brainer to say yes. Okay. The whole no, I mean, only a few of us have something to say. <laughs> um, well, uh, frankly, uh, <laughs> man, I haven't been on stage in decades, literally. And uh, folks have said, well, when are you going back to stage, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I said, uh, when I find something and, and when, when the time is right and, and when I find something um, that really knocks me out. And Scott Rudin, over the years, has approached me and those plays that he's approached me, we, we're, we're all pretty familiar with. But I, it was just, um, this really caught my attention. And it was simply reading the script. It's no chess game of, oh, is this going to pay off here? Or what do I do here? You know, it's just take the leap. Take the leap and do it. It, it was a leap because we knew that we were going to have workshops. So we knew that the play wasn't finished. But with Scott Rudin behind it, knowing that you know the the, the A team was going to be leading it, and with Sam and Lucas, and uh, and then I never felt weirdly. I I we I think we kind of stopped feeling there was no pressure about going to Broadway in the rehearsal room, ever. Um, there could have been, but there there just wasn't. We just uh, we were all working as a team, and we you know, just kept progressing every day, and there wasn't the 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 stress that could come with that. I will also say that I think sometimes bringing a play to Broadway creates pressure that can be bad for the play. Is it, 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 it put, it, um, in order to be in a commercial marketplace, do you have to make sacrifices to the play? Do you have to cast the play in a way that isn't your ideal way to cast it to make it reach an audience? Do you have to make certain kind of compromises to make it work in the marketplace? And we had the opposite experience, which is that um, you have a play that's great roles for actors, but it's hard to, you know, uh, you've, um, uh, Lori and Chris don't live in town. It's hard to get them here. It's hard to get a cast together um, for a play. And the fact that we had an opening night date on Broadway and Scott um, so devoted to it meant that we could dream about who we, who we, we really did just re have a meeting and dream about who we wanted and, and Scott, while we were having that meeting, could text those people and, <laughs> you know, coerce them into getting on an airplane. And that, that is, um, it's the, I think it's sort of the opposite of did the pressure of Broadway make it challenging? It actually, for this play, was, a very, was the very lucky opposite of that. Well, I think it's a very lucky situation for all of us on Broadway. Thank you for bringing this show. Thank you for your guests. <laughs>